So you and my sister keep giving me a hard time about not shaving my beard. But you have to realize that when I shave my beard, I look like an overgrown baby with the sad, <laughs> drooping eyes of a 30-year-old man who's lived a hard life. Yeah, it's, it's the Bell's palsy didn't help. <laughs> no. So it makes you look like one of those guys from the hills have eyes. It's right. I know. And if you shave yourself bald and shave the oh beard. Oh, my. I Horrifying. <laughs> And especially we'll because I inherited, I inherited your family's hairlessness. <laughs> so I've Not got my no, family, your mom's. Oh, you've got no chest hair. That's a, yeah, I've got a hair. Well, okay, no, never mind. I did. You're right. It is That's mom's. A, yeah, you got it from mom's side. This man is a hell of a lot hairier than I am. I am her suit. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that Turkish blood in us. It must be. <laughs> All right, everyone, we are back here at Cross and Clay Studios. Um, I'm your host, Junior. Dirty Clyde is getting his beer and come back to the mic. Hi. Hi, there he is. So today we're drinking uh, Wild Rose Breweries, High Harvest Hemp Blonde, and Parallel 49's Frosted Tips IPA. <laughs> Frosted Tips. Sounds like a, sounds like a chick's drink. <laughs> Anyways, uh, okay, oh boy. So this one's not a scary episode. I'm going to come out and say that nothing scary in this episode. Last week's was pretty dank. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty grim. Yeah, it was grim and scientific. Yeah. Um, no, this week we're covering a little, a little man well-known in the uh, George Nori community. If you don't know who George Nori is, do you remember I used to listen to Art Bell? Yeah. Like Coast to Coast AM. Yeah. George Norrie's kind of his successor. Uh, he now runs Coast to Coast AM. No, today we're covering Canadian politician, World War II veteran, aeronautical engineer, and 95-year-old white guy, Paul Hellyer. Nothing better than a 95-year-old white guy. Oh, yeah. And he's... He looks like a 95-year-old white guy. He's still alive, I should point out. Does he have the ears that come down to his shoulders? Uh, pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he looks like somebody's great-grandpa. Um, born August 6, 1923, and raised on a farm in Waterford, Ontario. When he came of age, he studied aeronautical engineering at the Curtis Wright Technical Institute in Glendale, California. As I said, he served in World War II holding the rank of gunner in the Royal Canadian Army in, the, in an artillery regiment. Um, in, Those guys always live. Well, yeah, because they're at the way back. <laughs> yeah, 10 miles behind the lines. Uh, it makes, I mean, World War II, that is mostly what Canadians, well, no, sorry, it's World War I where Canadians mostly uh, were the ones crazy enough to actually walk in front of a rolling barrage. That is correct. Uh, World War II, we were mostly pilots. Yeah, a lot of pilots, a lot of Air Force. A lot of Air Force, a lot of the more safe positions on the back line. My own granddad was an uh, airplane mechanic. Mm -hmm. Never never made it to England, though, on the way uh, the war ended. Never got on the boat. <laughs> That's actually similar to my wife's grandpa. He, um, he was on the boat over when the war ended, so he had the unenviable job of cleanup. Oh. <laughs> in in the European theater, the limb patrol. Yeah, it was a. He never talked about it. It was apparently pretty grim over there. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Um. In 1949, at only 26 years old, Paul Hellier was elected as a Liberal candidate in Davenport, becoming the youngest MP ever elected at that point in Canadian history. It also marked his first stint in off in the office of the Defense Minister, serving as Associate Minister of Defense. Under Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent, he lost his seat in 1957, regaining it a year later in 58 as a member of the official opposition in the Diefenbaker government. The good old Dief. The Diefenbachel. The Diefenbachel. <laughs> um, here's where it gets a little more interesting. He continued to serve under Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson, my personal favorite Prime Minister. Uh, he was liberal, and he also tried to get us nuclear weapons. Um... He broke the nonpartisan deadlock. So there was a deadlock in uh, the uh, cabinet at that time. Between It wasn't on party lines like it normally is. In this case, it was actually bipartisan. It was about half the conservatives wanted nuclear weapons, half of them didn't. 
half the liberals wanted nuclear weapons, half of them didn't. And he stood on the safe side. Well, he stood on the side of getting nuclear weapons. Oh, yeah. did he? Yeah. He got us, he tried to order us two uh, nuclear missiles. Um, it was his successor, uh, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, Justin Trudeau, current sitting Prime Minister's father, um, who actually kiboshed the deal. Oh, he was a hippie. He was a hippie. He also pirouetted <laughs> behind the Queen. He also oh, hated the West. And you know, for that reason, I will never his, like him. Almost as much as his son does. Yeah, almost as much. Not quite as much. I think no. his son's got a little more out there for us. And he's definitely not a lizard person, just so you know. No. There's just nothing about him that speaks lizard. No, he's just a privileged white boy. Earthworm. <laughs> I'm thinking more earthworm. <laughs> more earthworm, that's right. Robin fodder. Um, <laughs> this, uh, I, I believe this deal is actually what led to him losing the leadership in the next election, uh, being replaced by Pierre Trudeau. Under Pearson, Hellyer served as a minister of national defense where he actually was the one who oversaw the unification of the three branches of the Canadian military, the Army, Navy, and Air Force, into the single branch that we now call the Canadian Armed Forces. So he was the guy who was kind of in charge of the modernization of the Canadian military in the 60s. Um, in the 70s, Paul Hellyer walked over to the Progressive Conservative Party before crossing again in the 80s back to the Liberal Party before finally settling into a party of his own creation in the 90s called the Canadian Action Party, an anti-globalization party who pushed for a government-driven economy that was 50% private income generation and 50% government income generation. Um, by this point, his salad days of politics were long behind him. Um, as beyond forming this party, he doesn't really accomplish anything noteworthy. Uh, past the nine. Oh, <laughs> so that's that's our story for today. Thanks yeah, that's for that's our in. whole. Well, okay, I shouldn't say that. He doesn't accomplish anything noteworthy in terms of politics. Paul Hellier continued to work in politics for quite some time, even with rumors of him running as an NDP candidate in the 2015 election. Though he never did run. Um, while the unification of the armed forces was a major accomplishment, most people know him for the absolutely crazy crap he gets into starting in 2005. September 25th, 2005, four years and 14 days after the terrorist attack on 9-11, the world is in chaos. Bush is still president. The war in Iraq is still raging. We needed a light. A guy to take us through these dark times. Paul Hellyer knew the true existential risk that threatened all of us. At a speech at the University of Toronto, Paul Hellyer expressed that UFOs, and this is a quote, are as real as the airplanes that fly over your head. He also expressed that the current attempts of the U.S. government to build a permanent moon base was so the American Warhawks could shoot at the UFOs, potentially risking intergalactic war. Respected politician, former Minister of Defense, World War II veteran and aeronautics engineer Paul Hellyer believes in a secret American moon base project, and that's only the tip of the iceberg of awesome that this man has in store for us. <laughs> I can't wait. All right, let's get that music that uh, Cross and Clay's queued up for us, and we'll, we'll be, be right, right back. Back after this.
And that's why you should never use an electric shaver in the tub. That sounds like it hurt. Well, it was uncomfortable. I don't doubt it. So, back to our main topic of the night. How did Paul Hellyer go from pretty normal old white dude to old white dude who believes in UF and a great UFO cover-up? Let me introduce you to a man named Peter Jennings. You're kidding. Yeah, Peter Jennings gets tied into this. <laughs> Peter Jennings was, for those of you who were born sometime in the 90s, a Canadian-American journalist. He was born in 1938 and passed away in 2005 from lung cancer. His list of credentials are as, if not more, impressive than Paul Hellier's. He got his start in journalism at the age of nine, where he hosted a Canadian radio show. As an adult, he started by hosting a news broadcast on CJOH-TV Ottawa, as well as a teen dance show called Saturday Date. In 1965, he was recruited by ABC to host their flagship evening news show, the time as a foreign correspondent, and hosted World News Tonight in 1978. He was up there with Tom Brokaw of NBC and Dan Rather on CBS as one of the big three news anchors. September 11th, 2001, he did a 17-hour straight coverage of the collapse of the World Trade Center for ABC. At this time, he was still one of the biggest news anchors on American television. This was not a man to be taken lightly. So when he lent his voice to Mark Obenhaus, writer and director of a certain documentary, it was a voice that people knew and recognized as a voice of authority and truth in a time when people still largely trusted the news media. That documentary was UFOs, Seeing is Believing, a 2005 documentary that covered the phenomenon of UFO sightings and experiences. The documentary sparked something special in the heart of a certain elderly World War II veteran and former defense minister, Paul Hellyer. Let me just stop you here. Because Peter Jennings is very, very possibly a lizard person. <laughs> You've had a real good look at him. He's got a face like a catcher's mitt. Well, he doesn't anymore because he's deceased. But mark my words. <laughs> Anyway, continue. Paul Hellier doesn't just believe in UFOs, though. <laughs> so this is the big connection. This is what one of the things that gets Paul Hellier into UFOs. I should point that out. There were uh, a number of other books he read um, that got him into it as well. Uh, I can't remember the name of the book, but there was a book as well that he's personally cited as being what got him not just into UFOs, but into the idea of UFO disclosure. So UFO disclosure is the idea that our government have been studying and researching UFOs, which is actually true. It's kind of been lost under the haze of Trumpism, but a couple of years ago, something rather big came out of the United States government due to a Freedom of Information Act uh, request. They have, in fact, been studying UFOs since the 50s. They've been documenting them, and the documents on it are now publicly available. The same is true of Canada's government, though apparently that was actually shut down sometime in the 90s because just not much was coming of it. Paul Hillier doesn't. Paul Hellier doesn't just believe in UFOs. Strictly speaking, a UFO is just an object in the sky that we can't recognize and is thus unidentified. So, a UFO, like I said, just an object in the sky that we can't recognize. Literally, an unidentified flying object. Yeah, well, they'd have to uh, uh, research those. Well, yeah, because it could be a, a spy plane. It could, it could be extraterrestrial life. It could be undocumented immigrants trying to get into our country from Mexico. Via weather balloon. <laughs> via, via one of those paper balloons only on a large scale. <laughs> with all of the poor Mexican folks just breathing hot air underneath oh, it to get it going. 
And others are paddling their feet like crazy to create enough <laughs> drift. Um, no, Peter Hellyer straight up states that these are aliens. Oh, aliens. Capital A. Capital A, aliens. He claims that in 1961, during the Cold War, that there was a sighting of 50 UFOs coming down from the North Pole. After an investigation, he claims that it was discovered that four different alien species have been visiting Earth over time. Let's point out that this is when he was defense minister that he's claiming this happened. Yet he never said a word of it back in 1961. Oh, maybe he was uh, sworn to secrecy. Or maybe it didn't happen. (laughs) Or maybe he just (laughs) made it all up. I don't think he made it up. I'm going to give Paul Hellier credit here, and this will come up a little more later. Most of what he's saying, I don't think he made up. I think this is coming from other sources, stuff that he's read, stuff that he's studied, because he's not a dumb man. No. He's an engineer. He's an accomplished politician. He has some wacky ideas. Even before 2005, he has some crazy ideas about economics. He was very staunchly anti-globalization of the economy. So we currently live in a globalized economy with things like the North America Trade Organization um, or Treaty Organization, whichever it is. Uh, NAFTA? NAFTA. Or Napster or whatever you call it next. NAFTA, North America Free Trade Agreement. Agreement. That's right. And then we have the North North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. Which which is more military than economic, but I see what you're saying. Yeah. Globalization with the United Nations. Yeah. And he's very, he's always very staunchly been against that. He's always been about a nationalized economy. This is something that's carried through his entire political career, part of why he abandoned the Liberal Party and the Progressive Conservatives, and why he went on to tr- uh, form his own party, because in his opinion, the NDP no longer served nationalized interests and was instead, like everybody else, into globalization. Because, frankly, you kind of have to be nowadays. The way information travels, if we don't link up our economies officially, they're unofficially linked anyways. Right. So it's not like back in the 50s when you had to actually, like, know somebody to call them on the other side of the ocean. That's right. Um, News didn't travel as fast as it does now. But no, he also believes in four alien species. Some of these, he claims, live on one of Saturn's moons. Another species he claims live on Mars and another on Venus and that they have a sort of federation and interact with one another on a regular basis. He also claims that these aliens are mad at us for polluting the earth and have been attempting to warn us and contact us to help resulting in us firing on them and losing planes in conflict with them. When I say he gets into bonkers stuff, I mean bonkers. (laughs) So far, he hasn't been, like, totally bonkers. Because this is stuff that you hear about all the time. Well, this is all very cut and dried, basic UFO UFO stuff. stuff. Yeah. Um, According to Hellier, not only have extraterrestrials visited our planet, but it is the... And this is where... I I told you earlier, okay? I'm going to pause for a sec. I told you earlier that... This takes a dark turn. Shit gets real. And I'm going to have to clarify. You're going to have to learn some code here to understand why this is twisted (laughs) and why this isn't just like fun and silly, weird conspiracy stuff. This gets into a bit of a weird place. Does it keep you up at night? No. Well, I mean, it keeps me up with rage. <laughs> not, not with fear, but it keeps me up with rage. You have to understand that this is not good stuff. Um, according to Hellier, not only have extraterrestrials visited our planet, but it is the international bankers, fitting with his political warnings against globalized economy, that have been working to keep extraterrestrial economy or technology from our hands, even though it could be used to solve all of humanity's problems, including global warming. Paul Hellyer actually believes that the Canadian government is hiding technology that could not only solve, but reverse global warming. 
which if they have that technology, Trudeau, I'm calling you out, release it. And I'll be totally okay with that damn pipeline you want to build. <laughs> I don't have a problem with the pipeline they want to build. Yeah, but I'm, my but main- I see your point. If there is knowledge that uh, would potentially save all of humankind first. Well, well, not just that, but my main concern with the pipeline is about the overuse of petrochemicals and the gradual boiling of our planet. If this technology can reverse global warming, I don't care how much oil you build, you I burn. It's an air conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> just a giant planetary just air conditioner. Big old air, or maybe it's just a little air conditioner and you just keep it on 24 <laughs> seven. <laughs> yeah. That'll solve the problem. Yeah. yeah. You just put it up in the atmosphere. It cools things off real good. But that's right. A secret cabal of bankers. And is, that again is not something that that you we haven't heard before. Well, and it makes sense with a guy who is got a political agenda. Yeah. To uh, to to you know prevent. And I'm going to tell you, there's a reason it's not something we haven't heard before, and that's where it gets a little weird and a little not great. Um. But yeah, he he believes that there's a secret cabal of bankers refusing to study and release alien technology that could be used to solve one of the biggest existential crises facing humanity. I have to say, as much as I think Paul Hellier is full of moose crap, I think living in his version of reality would be more interesting and just as troubling as living in the real world. (laughs) (laughs) So... What do we mean when we say global banker cabal? And this is important. This interested me because typically when we're talking about cabals of international bankers, we're getting into some really dicey territory. By which I mean super creepy, racist, and rhymes with panty asceticism. We're talking. You caught me halfway through a swig. (laughs) That's and that's probably good because we don't want to say (laughs) anti-Semitism. No, God, no. (laughs) No, we're getting into some David Icke territory, which you're wanting me to cover. I don't think you realize that's what you want me to cover, but that's what you want me to cover is David Icke. Oh, is that the lizard people? That's the lizard people. You see, I haven't done my research. I just know what I see. <laughs> <laughs> I know um, what I'm looking at. We're talking about, and I, I actually researched this because I didn't want to put words in this poor guy's mouth. Because again, I think he's, even with this, I think he's just parroting other guys. I think he's just parroting other UFO researchers. He's an opportunist, so he's taking ideas that will suit his agenda. Not just, I don't even think it's about his agenda. He's 95 years old. I think, I think he's just bought into it. And, and part of buying into UFOs is buying into the, the lore and the mythology of UFOs. Yeah. Um, but the problem is, is that that can take you in several directions. And in this particular case, it took him towards David Icke. He's been cited at David Icke conferences. And I should point out, David Icke has been banned from Canada. Oh. He's not allowed in Canada because he's a giant anti-Semite. Oh, yeah. Well, (laughs) is he a member of uh, Aryan Nations or anything like that? No, but his ideas are used to attack Jews on a regular basis. So David Icke believes, as I've mentioned, in lizard people, essentially that there are a a secret cabal of a race of lizards. It just so happens that all of these lizard people are Jews. (laughs) Which, you know, I mean, that makes absolutely no sense. No, and I'm not going to. If anything, they're the first true people. (laughs) Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm not going to get super into David Icke today, uh, but because it's come up with Paul Hellyer here, we're definitely going to have to cover it now because this is something people need to be aware of. And so that if they get into those weird shit, like I do, I love weird shit. I'm all about it. I've been into it since I was like a kid. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You were also afraid of volcanoes and of spontaneously combusting. So, you know, yeah, well, who's not <laughs> Gosh, if that's a real thing. You could just be sitting at home, have a wet fart, and kaboom. (laughs) There you go. Up like a light, like a Roman candle. I Um, was smoking a cigar on Thursday night, and I 
had just eaten a rather fruitful bowl of chili when kaboom. Yeah. So when I was researching this, this is how I knew this is the direction it was going. I started talking about two families and something called the Federal Reserve. Did, like, Paul that, Hellier... That's the U.S. Federal Reserve that's he's right. talking about. Yeah. yeah. Paul Hellier has understandable reasons to not like the U.S. Federal Reserve. He's into a totally nationalized economy. So I think what happened is that these ideas fit so well into his political ideas that he just kind of accepted them as obviously being true. But when we start talking about the Federal Reserve, we start talking about two families in particular, the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. All right. Which leads us into the Bilderberg Group, which leads us into Zionist conspiracy. And it always goes in this order. So it's not Jews I don't like, it's Zionists, which means you don't like Jews. Right. I'm well, sorry. Like <laughs> theoretically, he he uh, people perceive that Zionists are are the organized faction of the Jewish nation who are uh, seeking right. to undermine everything that real good Christian yeah. human beings do. So when we get into this, we're talking about a white nationalist dog whistle for Jews. That's what we're talking about. And whether or not he realizes that's what he's saying when he says international bankers or, you know, Federal Reserve, that is what he's saying. Words have meaning and they sometimes have meaning that we don't intend. Right. Um, and that's what I think the case is here. So when we're talking David Icke, when he says reptilian, what he's really meaning is Jews. Same thing when you hear a lot of pundits, one in particular, Alex Jones, likes to use the term goblins to refer to Jews. And yeah, this means that I don't think uh, a certain children's author realizes what she did when she had goblins running the bank in Hogwarts. Oh. Yeah. I don't. Well, that was unintentional. I well, but I don't no, think. But no, I, I, I don't think point. Paul Hellier's being intentional either. No, but that's it, that's my point. Is she has greedy, big nosed creatures running the bank? Well, <laughs> and I see your point. I mean, there was a time, and uh, I mean, this isn't really the platform for that discussion. But there was a time when anti-Semitism was rife throughout. Western Europe and North America. And I would say it still is just not as openly. Yes. But in, yeah. at the time of the second world war, we all seem to be above all that. When the evil deeds of the yeah, German Reich that's were right. discovered, we were all, Oh, well, we would never, we just never <laughs> had the opportunity. And that was the, that, that exactly. That yeah. was the crime because yeah. we wanted to hold someone accountable for that. Yeah, for that feeling. Yeah. So, like I said, knowing, knowingly or otherwise, this World War II vet may have crossed the battlefield instead of the uh, the uh, House of Commons and uh, in the twilight years of his life. Sure enough, his ideals go back to narratives involving the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers, like I said, and the Bilderberg Group. Not only that, Paul Hellier has attended functions hosted by no and anti-Semite David Icke. Um has been called by white nationalist groups such as Infowars and Breitbart and further made implications that the Illuminati is running the U.S. government. Well, you know, I can't really see that. <laughs> Having been approached by the Illuminati, <laughs> I have to tell you, they look pretty fancy, but I'm not convinced. <laughs> yeah. I um. Oh, I also asked my own personal contact into the uh, secret orders oh. about the Illuminati and um, he guffawed. <laughs> so that's all BS. Oh, there you go. As far as he's concerned. Yeah. I, and, and he's and pretty high up there. I, I, like, and I, like I said, because it's come up here, this is something I'm going to do an episode on later. But the Illuminati were a real group and they really did do a lot of the stuff that we accuse them of doing. Just not in the way that I think a lot of us think they do. Yeah. Namely, they did that to the Masons. <laughs> right. Right. 
they, that was their whole shtick was basically a lot of their ideas were just copied from the Masons because this guy wanted to start his own little cult. And he did that by infiltrating the Masons, placing people in high positions of certain lodges, and then taking over those lodges. Which is really funny if you meet Mason. They're old men. Well, not even. There's some young guys at, at well, some of those just, lodges, and they're just people that are looking for some fellowship, yeah. I think. Well, the, the, no, that, that's not just what you think. That's what they are. They're yeah. a social club. Yeah. They're a social club for people who don't have that in other ways. It's yeah. fine. I don't, I don't think the Masons are nefarious. And, you know, maybe I'm just a shill because my grandpa's a Mason. Yeah, but. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> then I'd be a shill. I ate their ducks. Yeah. Well, that's right. <laughs> Damn good ducks, I'll tell you. Yeah. <sighs> so... <laughs> Dead space. Yeah, no dead space because, like, I don't know. This just gets into a place where I'm just not happy because I just wanted a silly UFO guy, and then it turns into this. So, does it get darker still? Um, no. I would say that's about as dark as it gets. That's where that's where we have left. Uh, the honorable Paul Hillier <laughs> is uh, sitting in his study. Read and, and and here's the thing: is he's releasing a trilogy of books now. Which is about this. But I also want to talk a bit about where this idea actually comes from. Because believe it or not, David Icke didn't come up with it. David Icke came up with the lizard people angle of it. But the actual idea all goes back to one book. It's one book that if you talk to people who are into this white nationalist crap. Especially the ones who are high up and pushing the ideas. Have all read. It's called None Dare Call It a Conspiracy. It's a crappy, crappy book. And I'm going to do a whole episode just on that book because we, it needs to be addressed in this current political climate. It needs to be addressed. The book basically outlines the supposed plans of this inner group of Kabbalistic Jewish bankers and their attempts to basically in debt, the world drive us into chaos and take over. That was a huge, huge hot button probably 20 years ago. Oh, guess when the book came out in the 70s. Yeah. So. Well, and I mean, that was, that was like 40 yeah, years four, ago. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Right. But, um, but, you know, I mean, ideas take time to disseminate. Evolve and yeah. that whole idea, when I was, would have been in high school, in college, the whole idea of the um, Jewish conspiracy yeah was was gaining ground uh, yeah. among certain groups of people yeah now i always thought it was just bs if anything you see you see jews in positions of economic uh power etc because they had to be wiser with their money having lost what they lost having been chased from country to well, country to country they had to be more frugal. They and had when, to be more cautious. When about we talk how they about banks money. in particular, we put them there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like they could, like Christians back in the in the even not even just the Middle Ages, but even as late as like the Victorian era, couldn't lend money at interest to one another. Right. So you had no guaranteed way to get that money back. Jews weren't bound by that because they weren't Christians. So they became money lenders. Same thing with um, the uh, the Aryans. The when I say Aryans, I want to be clear here. In this context, I'm not talking white people. I'm talking a religious group that was a split off of Christianity very very early on. There was an Aryan group the that because mainline Christians didn't consider them Christian would do the same thing. Um. It was all, and that's how they became in charge of these big banks is because they were the bank. Yeah. You'd give your money to them and they'd lend it out at interest because they could do that because nobody else could. And then that also gave you as the Christian, the uh, uh, ability to then, uh, you know, treat this person with derision. Exactly. uh, Because of, oh, look at you, money lender. Yeah. Look at me, how lily white I am. (laughs) That's right. Although I'm not... I'm I'm uh, more than happy to let my money accrue interest. That's right. In your bank. That's right. And and if you guys want an example, um, Merchant of Venice is about that. 
The like, whole Medici series on Netflix. Yeah. Shameless plug <laughs> is about that whole concept. That's right. And and so if like and so we have to understand that yeah, there might be a disproportionate number of Jews running banks, but that's because we put them there. That's not because they have some nefarious plot to overthrow the world. It's because for hundreds of years they were the only ones who could do it. Um not overthrow the world. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> do the banking. <laughs> now, that said, do I think there is a secret cabal that is knowingly or otherwise controlling the world? Yes. They're called rich white guys. Yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> Multinational. Yeah. D- uh, Donald Trump, Marie Le Pen, current political candidate Jason Kenney, all know each other. Um, and they're all leaning in the same it's direction political. Politi- right. Yeah, it's. And well, I, I well, don't because the political left has very little use for untold wealth. It's true. That's it, not what they're out for. Um, the political right is all about accruing in accruing wealth, accruing money for a small group of people. And I think, and I'm not just talking the regular political right because I think there are a lot of perfectly reasonable fiscal conservatives out there. I'm talking what we now call the alt-right, which when I was younger, we called the Tea Party, which way back in the day, we just called them what they were, fascists. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's what they are. That's what Donald Trump is. And even look at the way they act. They're looking for an outside enemy that they can blame all the problems that they've created on. Um, In the case of Donald Trump, it's Mexicans. In the case of Marie Le Pen, it was Islam, Islam, ugh, sorry, Muslim immigrants. Right. <laughs> so maybe that's our problem. We can't have an alt right because, like, there's nobody to hate. Well, like in Canada, there's lots. The problem is, is that they're from Canada. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's really hard to push an alt-right narrative when the people you want to kick out of your country were the first people to inhabit it. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think that uh, I would tend to think it's more of an East West problem in, in Canada. We uh, absolutely. And I think that's the narrative that Jason Kenney pushes is that the, what the East is out to get us and the West is the true heart of Canada, which is probably true, but (laughs) <laughs> if you look at I, equalization, if you look at lots of different... Well, uh, equal, like content. I'm not even going to get into equalization because it's a, it's actually way more complicated than a lot of people realize. Oh, I, yeah. It's super well, complicated. Here, here's, here's one that dumbs it right down for you, though. Hey, I'm, I'm a self-employed business person. I had my taxes done. My accountant uh, toggled the wrong switch. I didn't pay CPP this year. Uh, being self-employed, I have no way to pay it, so I pay it usually through my taxes at the end mm-hmm. of the year. Um, she toggled the wrong... Uh, I'd done some some piecework uh, as a substitute teacher, so I paid $1.99 in CPP. So she toggled the QPP instead oh, no. and put $1.99, and I was getting 190 bucks back at the end of the day. Oh, boy. And she said, that's... Strange, I can't find out why you're not pay- being charged for CPP. Then she realized her mistake, toggled the, and I was paying $190. So to clarify for any, because I have a lot of American listeners of the 18 listeners that we have. We have 18 listeners? <laughs> we have 18 listeners. I really thought I was the only one that, <laughs> that's so exciting. Um no, I have an erection. So we're talking Canada pension plan and Quebec pension plan. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And you pay into it. Every human being in Canada does if they work. Yeah. And it's, part uh, they, of, it's essentially part of your income tax. Yeah. And you get it when you're old. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so <laughs> it was kind of interesting. I was kind of curious. Well, if I'm in Quebec, they're not going to charge me for a QPP if I paid a dollar ninety nine. But if I'm in any other part of Canada, I'm going to be charged for my CPP. Yep. I, I think that has something to do with the fact that Quebec has opted out of CPP. 
they may well have, but they have QPP, which is the their equipment. own. They are they are bound to offer a security. Yes, as, as yeah. being as part of Canada. Being part of Canada, so they have to they have to offer an equivalent or better program in order to opt out. Everything okay? Oh, everything's good. Okay, good. Well, I, just, I saw him fiddling with the recording program. I just wanted to make sure. I just wanted to check our time. I wanted to make sure we're not babbling for like 95 minutes. No, I didn't. I, like, I'm kind of um, out of Paul Hellier stuff for the most part because I just wanted to take this as a moment to clarify how easy it is to fall down these holes. When I was in my 20s, I actually fell down the Rothschild Rockefeller hole. Oh, you got caught into the I got caught into it. world I, of... Until I got deeper into it. And then I started to realize what they're really talking about. Man. Oh, they're talking Rothschilds. They're not talking like some secret European group. No, they're talking Jews. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. They're not, they're not talking about anything real. Um, and I, I did fall down that hole a little bit. I actually had a boss who frequently listened to a very, very white nationalist radio show when we worked called red ice radio um you have to pay through a paywall to get into red ice radio but it's a messed up world this is a a swedish guy and i don't think people realize this but yeah we talk a lot about how great the nordic countries are they're great at a lot of stuff when it comes to like they are not very tolerant they're racially. not a tolerant people they are not and and sweden is one of the worst I heard somewhere a theory that the farther north you get, the less tolerant people become. Well, because, like, I'm sorry, if you're from Iraq, Afghanistan, Palestine, India, why on God's green earth would you want to move as far north as Norway? Economic opportunity. That's about the only reason. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they do. Like, I'm not going to say they, they don't. they do, but, it, the, but life is very hard. Yeah. And, and when you see this in Canadians all the time, we take a bit of pride in like how good we are at withstanding cold weather. We take a bit of pride and we're the true North because we're a rugged individualist people up here. Mm -hmm. um, I will actually say Canada is probably the exception in terms of, of integration and all that as a Nordic country. More, more because uh, we were subject to the, the uh, influx of immigration periodically over our history. Yeah, well, that's and how so we got founded. Even though there's this hotbed still mm -hmm. in Canada, this this mindset that if you were among the first um, United Kingdom, yeah, immigrants to Canada, you are the first Canadians. You are the people. Yeah. And, and you still hear people saying, why don't they go back where they came from? Why are they taking our jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, all, all it's kind of interesting because every single Canadian, except the First Nations people, are immigrant. It's every ridiculous. single ridiculous. We should then all go back to where we came from. Absolutely. <laughs> and I don't want to. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. I like living in Canada. No. Um, and, and, you know, that's a that's a bit of white privilege like i'm going to call it out like yeah, i like living in canada i like having this opportunity i also recognize that i live on stolen land <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> like this isn't this isn't my people quote unquote home um i say that because i'm a euro mutt <laughs> like well i'm kind of jealous of my wife who's so easily able to <laughs> there's a, there's enough to share yeah and there's enough to share well but it's interesting that you bring up the whole concept of Mr. Hillier and uh, how easily a man as intelligent as that is is sucked into that whole vortex of hate. Yeah, without even realizing that's what he's done. Because I, I look, he never talks about the rest of this theory. I think he genuinely thought it was just an economic thing. Yeah. I don't think he genuinely thought, realized that that's, this is what it was really about. Um, and, but that's how it happens. It happens in these little baby steps. And that's how you get radicalized. Like you don't get radicalized all at once. It's not like somebody straps you down to a chair and says, you're going to hate Jews and black people now. <laughs> that's not how it works. It's over time, little things here and there. And, and that's why like 
a lot of people get really frustrated when they say, check your privilege or you've got white privilege. You need to understand why they're saying that is because all it takes is these baby steps before you're going out the other side. That's right. And, and one of the best ways to prevent that is to sit down and just think about, well, what do I have that other people don't have? And I've come to that awareness a few times because my entire success at anything at all has been because I come from an upper middle class family. My wife and I could not have lived where we live if both of us didn't come from upper middle class families. Even when I was unemployed, I was benefiting from the fact that I was born in the upper middle class. Yeah. Which I'm going to point out, guys, mostly white people. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Well, what do you have in store for us in future episodes? Um, Oh, I've got all sorts of stuff coming up. Like I said, I've got at least now at this point, two big topics that I'm going to have to cover. Um, next week, I have no idea. Well, next week we're not doing anything cause you're going to be out of town. That's correct. I'll be in Florida. Yeah. So, um, meeting with the original dirty Clyde. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, so I'll be doing a, probably a bigger topic for the week after that, but guys, we're on iTunes now. So if you want to search the Canuckonomicon on iTunes, you can subscribe there. Leave us a review and a comment because iTunes likes that stuff. And also because I want to see what you guys think. Let us know how our sound is this week because we've got a bit of a different setup. I think it's a better one. It were stereo. If you mm-hmm. notice, I'm mm-hmm. in the left channel. I'm in the right channel. Did you no, get that mixed up? it's the other up? way around. You got that mixed up. Yeah, it's totally you mixed dingus. up. Okay, I'm in the right channel. I'm in the left channel. <laughs> um, guys, uh, also, I would encourage you guys to... Uh, Check us out on Twitter. I go on there all the time. If you want podcast recommendations, just ask me. I'm on Twitter, and I do it all the time. That's correct. Junior uh, is on to the podcast. That's right. I am at the Canuckonomicon on Twitter, or at Canuckonomicon on Twitter. You can email us, Canuckonomicon at gmail.com. Um, I'm just going to give a couple shout-outs to a couple other podcasts that I think you guys should check out. Uh, the Cryptid Keeper podcast. Hosted by two wonderful ladies. Um, They do a great job of covering just all sorts of weird cryptids. Um, I particularly recommend Jeff the Mongoose episode because that is totally insane and outside the purview of this show. So I really want you guys to check that out because it's wacky. Um, If you're into Dungeons and Dragons, the Bombarded cast, that's bomb, barred, all caps, dead. Uh, Wonderful show. It's got some original music in it as well. Really cool show. So with that, guys, a bit of a shorter episode today, but uh, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you in the future. Keep your eyes open.